from East Flat Rock, North Carolina, we welcome you to Faith in God Missions with the Reverend Steve and Frida Bishop. This program has been paid for by Faith in God Missions, a ministry working to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and preach the gospel in the United States and the foreign fields. Join us now as we worship the Lord together in word and song. Trouble sometimes are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear, now is at stake. Humbling your heart to God, seize from the chastening rod. Sink the way pilgrims trod, Christians away. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Man, he will be there to trump his side. Troubles will soon be o'er, happy forevermore. When we meet on that shore, free from all care, rising up in the sky, telling this world goodbye. Homeward we then shall fly, his glory to share. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Man, he will man, be there to drop his side. Troubles will soon be or will be happy forevermore. When we meet on that shore, free from all care, we'll be rising up in the sky, telling this world goodbye. Homeward we then shall fly, glory to share. Jesus is coming soon. Oh, 
Opportunity to preach the word of God. Thankful for faith in God missions and the bishops and the opportunity they've extended to us to come and preach the word. And uh, just excited about the goodness of the Lord in allowing us to do something for Him in these last days. And I'm glad that He is uh, still at work. He has not vacated the throne. He is not. Uh, he is not absent. He is not unaware. I'm glad that the Lord is. In charge. Well, I've been knowing the bishops for a while and pleased for the opportunity to come and preach. And uh, I want to uh, deal today really just with one verse, but I'm going to read three verses in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 3, and beginning in verse 14. Really, this is just a complete thought and don't want to just jump in the middle of a thought. But in verse 14, he says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, Believed on in the world, received up into glory. Father, help us as we look at your word. May your son be honored and magnified. May sinners repent and believe. And the saints be encouraged and helped. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul, writing to young Timothy, is explaining to him in verses 14 and 15 the purpose of his letter. He is desiring to come unto Timothy, but he said, These things write unto you, unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long. In other words, he intended to come, but he was not sure how long it would take. And in case it took a while for him to get there, he said he wanted Timothy to know how he ought to behave himself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. In other words, he was laying out some groundworks for how the service ought to be of the Lord, how the uh, services ought to be conducted, how the church should function. And he says in verse 15 that the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. A pillar is something upon which something stands. It is that that holds something up. And then the ground, the idea of the word ground there is the foundation. And so the church, especially in the context that Timothy gives it or that Paul gives it to us, 
was to be where the church, where the truth was found, as well as that that proclaimed or sent forth the truth. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. The local church has been God's instrument for the preservation of his word and for the proclamation of his word. That's why he established uh, the, the church in the first place. He said, upon this rock, that is the truth of who he was, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So since that time, the church has been preserving and the church has been proclaiming God's holy word and the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul was writing to inform Timothy of how to go about that business. And in verse 16, he closes this chapter with a great verse that explains to us and gives to us the truth of who Jesus is. He says, and without controversy... A little phrase, without controversy, it means to speak the same thing. And I understand that in the world we live in, there are many denominations and groups of various uh, churches who are made up of true believers. But the reality is, in all of those, there are some common denominators that uh, declare and define us as true believers. One of those important areas is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so when he says without controversy, what he's saying is the things that he's about to list are held dearly by all believers of whatever stripe they may be. And there is common ground among anyone who's saved who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says we speak the same thing on these matters. He says without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. The word mystery in the New Testament, it is a word uh, that means something that was formerly hidden but is now revealed. It is something that is revealed to the initiated, something that was not known prior. And so when he speaks of the mystery of godliness, he explains to us what this mystery of godliness is when he says God was manifest in the flesh. We find that when we read verse 16, what we're seeing is truth about who Jesus is and what he did in his earthly ministry. So the mystery of godliness then is the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, what does that mean? Well, Jesus is God. And so to understand what God is like, godliness, that's what the word means, God-likeness, to understand what God is like and who God is, we are to look at the Son of God. It is Jesus who shows us God uh, and his person. And it's also in Jesus that we find how we are to be like God, that we find that we can have the righteousness of God placed on our account uh, through what he has done in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. So as we look at these verses, or at this, this verse primarily, I want to really just lift five things out of it and give them to you uh, as we study the Word of God together. First of all, I would mention the manifestation of Jesus Christ. The manifestation of Jesus Christ. The word manifest here, it implies that he pre-existed. God was manifest in the flesh. For something to be manifested, for something to come into view, then it had to already be existent. And we find that that is true of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Hebrews, verse 1 through 3, we read in chapter 1, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Much is learned about who Jesus is. We find out that it was him who was appointed heir of all things. We find there the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ. We find also that of him all things were made. And that tells us that at the time of creation, he must already have been around. He is the express image of the person of God. In John chapter number 1 and verse number 1, we read, 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he says, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In the beginning was the Word, capital W. Christ was there in the beginning. That's reminiscent of the first chapter and the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And in the beginning, Jesus was there, the Word. He says, and the Word was with God. So we find his preexistence, and he, was, and he is uh, there in the beginning. We find his coexistence, and the Word was with God. Christ dwelling with God, co-equal and co-existent. And then the Word was God. Then we find that he is self-existent. God in three persons. Christ is very God of very God. And he says in verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. So Christ, God, manifest in the flesh, tells us that he was already here before he came and was incarnate in Bethlehem. And so when we think about this manifestation, we think about different times in the Old Testament when he showed up. He showed up and wrestled with Jacob at Peniel. Joshua saw him at Jericho. And we think about the Hebrew boys in the furnace in the book of Daniel. There was a fourth man there. That was Jesus Christ with them. But of course, it is in Bethlehem when God was manifest in the flesh. It is then that the body prepared for him was given him and he was conceived in the womb of a virgin there and then birthed in a manger in Bethlehem. I like what Spurgeon said about that. He said, man may go up to God now that God has come down to man. God was manifest in the flesh. In John chapter number 14, verses 8 to 11, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but of the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Philip said, Jesus, would you just roll back the clouds? Let us look into the glory world and see God. And the Lord Jesus said, Philip, have I been so long with you? Do you not understand that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father? What a great truth. Jesus claimed to be God. You see, the problem many have is they want to say, well, uh, Jesus was a good man and he was a prophet. You'll find the Muslims, they give some credence to Jesus as a prophet or a teacher or a good moral uh, teacher or a moral example. But you see, the Lord Jesus, when he was here, he went a lot farther than saying, I want to be a good example and a good teacher. He declared that he was God manifest in the flesh. He crossed a line. And so to try to accept Jesus as a good teacher and a good man, but merely a man, is to accept a lie. Jesus said, I'm God. And so if Jesus was a good man, how could he say that he was God and claim to be deity? No, he crossed a line. So when you take Jesus, when you accept Jesus, when you become a Christian, you understand and have to know without a doubt that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. In John 17, verse number 6, he says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. In John 1, verse number 18, he says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The little word declared there is where we get our English word exposition. And it is Jesus that has expounded or explained the Father unto us. Jesus is God. That's what we find that is true in verse number 16 of 1 Timothy 3. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. 
If anyone comes and denies the deity of Jesus Christ, you can mark them down as a false teacher. They are lost. They do not know God. But the Spirit of God enables Christians to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. He is one with God and one with the Holy Ghost. They are one. We believe in the Trinity. And that is a mark of true Christianity without controversy. We speak the same thing, that God was manifest in the flesh. Then the scripture tells us that he was justified in the spirit. We see here he is justified. Now, his justification. Now, when we think of justified, often we think that means to be made righteous. But in the case of Jesus Christ, he did not need to be made righteous for he was God and God cannot lie and in God there is no sin, there is no wrong. So he did not need to be justified but the word in the sense used here, it means to show, to exhibit, to evince one to be righteous such as he is and wishes himself to be considered. So in other words, when it says he was justified in the spirit, it is saying that the Spirit of God uh, showed him to be, exhibited him to be, proved him to be, affirmed him to be the very Son of God. This happened at his birth. You remember in the book of Luke, chapter number 2, uh, after the Lord Jesus had been brought into the temple to, be, uh, to have the rituals done unto him, in verse 25 it says, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now listen to this phrase. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. The Spirit of God was upon Simeon. And Simeon was in the temple at Jerusalem. And in verse 26 it says, And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Here was one of the instances in which the Spirit of God justified or showed Christ to be righteous, showed him to be the Son of God. It was when he was brought into the temple and Simeon, uh, Simeon led by the Spirit and filled with the Holy Ghost, declared it to be so. At his baptism in John 1, verses 32 and 33, John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And so he said to John, you're going to be baptizing and I'm going to come to you. I'm going to send my son there. And you'll know him because he'll be lit upon by the Spirit of God. And of course that did happen. The Lord Jesus came up out of the water and the Spirit of God descended upon, upon him like a dove and abode upon him. That was the Spirit of God justifying Jesus. That was the Spirit of God vindicating and affirming that he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. We see the Spirit working in justifying Christ through his miracles. Matthew chapter 12, verses 25 to 28. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. In other words, he said the miracles that are done in the power of the Holy Spirit of God are evidence that I am who I say that I am. It was so in his character. He was examined by the Spirit. He was put forth by the Spirit. I think about his character and how uh, even in the mouths of men it was proven to be so. You remember what those officers said. I believe it was in John chapter number 7 when they were sent out by the Pharisees to go and catch him in his words and find him saying something that they could bring against him. 
Those went their way and they began to try to examine him and see what he would say and try to catch him in his words. But instead of condemning him, they came back empty handed and they said, where is he? Why didn't you bring him? And they said, never man spake like this man. He speaks with another voice. He speaks with authority. He speaks as someone from another world. Pilate examined him. Pilate looked him over and he said, I find no fault in him. The spirit of God upon his life. Then in his resurrection, the Spirit justified him or verified and affirmed who he was. 1 Peter 3 verse 18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. There the resurrection is attributed to the Spirit of God, attesting to the holiness of Christ. It was impossible that death should hold him. In Romans 1, verses 1 to 4, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The Spirit of God declaring him to be the Son of God with power. The Spirit of holiness, he's called, by the resurrection of the dead. The justification of Christ. He was justified in the Spirit. The Spirit of God attesting to the holiness and righteousness of God in the flesh. And then there is the observation of Christ. The Bible says not only was he uh, manifest in the flesh and justified in the Spirit, but he was seen of angels. The word seen there has a few different nuances or uh, connotations. First of all, it means to see too. And of course, in the New Testament, we find the minister, we find the angels ministering or seeing to the needs of Jesus. You remember uh, there in the wilderness when he had prayed in his uh, uh, in his temptation, and after the devil had come and tempted him forty days and tempted him in all point uh, in all manner as we're tempted. And we find that he was weary and hungry and the angels came and they ministered unto him. And then again in the garden of uh, Gethsemane there as he prayed and his sweat turned to great drops of blood as he dreaded uh, the sin that would be placed upon him and the wrath of God and the absence of God from him for a season. And he prayed and the Bible said again, the angels came and ministered unto him. The angels of God, they seen him. They, they, they saw to him. They, he was seen of angels. Of course, they'd done this before. They'd done this in glory. They'd worshiped him around the throne. And so they ministered to him. But then we see this um, observation again in the meditation of the angels upon him. The word seen, it means to consider also, to think about, to behold Thank you for joining us today. This program has been paid for by Faith in God Missions of East Flat Rock, North Carolina, a ministry that's working in the United States and the foreign fields. Please send all correspondence to Faith in God Missions, Post Office Box G, East Flat Rock, North Carolina, 28726. Or visit us on the website at faithingodnc.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Faith in God Missions. Until next time, remember, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son.